that is this slide here, by which bicarbonate is activated, ammonia attacks to release phosphate, and another ATP is used to generate this carbon monophosphate compound. So, you know, the sequence of steps is, um, I mean, these are, these are pretty straightforward reactions. You don't have to worry about, about me memorizing the sequence of steps, but you should know that there's two ATPs taken up, and you should be able to recognize this compound. If not, it's pretty simple. You can probably draw it, but um, I probably wouldn't ask you to draw it. Um, and so this is the form then that the nitrogen gets embodied, so it gets embodied in an organic molecule so that it can go through this urea cycle and then get excreted as urea. Right. So you might ask, well, why not just excrete it as ammonium? And of course some organisms do. Right. So there should be some benefit for why um, uh, this urea cycle even exists. Right. And that's always a little problematic to talk about, but um, so, here's the urea cycle, um, carbon monophosphate coming in from that last reaction. And so the first step is an enzyme that's in, in the mitochondria, um, and it is it's called ornithine transcarbamylase, and it generates citrulline from ornithine. And so, if you remember the structure of arginine, right, which you should know, CCC, NCNN for the guanidinium group, CCCN, and you're done. Right? So this is basically lysine missing a methylene group. That's another way to think of ornithine. Missing a it's lysine missing a methylene. So instead of CH24, it's just CH23. Yeah. So this is um, not in the genetic code table, <coughs> but it's still an important amino acid in the cell for this reason. Right? And then citrulline, attach, attach um, this unit here onto, onto ornithine, right? So now we have CCCN and we have an amide at the end. Um, and then citrulline is actually transported from the mitochondria into the cytosol, okay? And that's where the rest of the cycle goes on. The cycle ends with the, for, for the formation of ornithine, the splitting off of urea, right? And then ornithine goes back into the matrix to pick up another carbon monoxide. So that it keeps on going around. So you have this interface here, whereby both of these, both ornithine and citrulline, have ways to have transports to get through the mitochondrial membrane. Right. So, on this slide, um, what we can see, I think is that glutamine, when it comes in, and this is what um, your question was, uh, glutamine comes in and glutaminase makes glutamate out of it, but the glut then the glutaminase splits off the ammonium here, right? but then glutamate also has, still has an ammonium on it because it has, it has the alpha NH3. So glutamine has, has a ni sorry, nitrogen on the side chain and a nitrogen in the alpha carbon, right? like any amino acid does. So that means it's got two equivalents of nitrogen. Right? So we should pay attention to where both of them go because they're both important for this whole process. So one of them gets generated by glutamate dehydrogenase and goes through carbon monophosphate and enters the urea cycle that way. The other one gets transaminated with oxaloacetate in the mitochondria um, and from glutamate, right? Because glutamine to glutamate transaminated to aspartate. Aspartate comes out of the mitochondria into the cytosol and then it donates its amino group into the urea cycle to form this arginosuccinate compound. And so after citrulline comes out, this reaction here, which is catalyzed by arginosuccinate synthase, right, is picking up another ammonia here from this NH3, this from which originally is is came from glutamate to aspartate. So you can think if, if that came from glutamate, it would be glutamine, glutamate, aspartate, and now into here. Right? And eventually it ends up here. Right? So the blue green label on the ammonia. So now I've got a green and a blue label, one of them being blue, one of them being green. And so both of those nitrogens right, are coming in. So Notice here that this is oxaloacetate in the mitochondria, and that's the last TCA cycle metabolite, right? 
And so what do we know about oxaloacetate in the TCA cycle? It's kept low. Its concentration is low. What's keeping it low? This. This, yeah. So um, this is um, presumably a way in which the concentration of that is a, in which oxaloacetate has a sink. And when, it's, when, it, when, when the amino transferase makes aspartate, it has to make aspartate because that's a specific substrate for this enzyme in the urea cycle. Therefore, if we're going to um, deliver aspartate from the mitochondria, so, um, and it's a transamination, then it must be coming from oxaloacetate because there's enzymes to do that. Any transamin if transaminase that's specific for aspartate will, will generate, um, will, will take the, take the carbon skeleton of oxaloacetate and then basically take that carbon skeleton and export it. So the effect of this will be to lower the concentration of oxaloacetate, which is what we want in the TCA cycle. Why? Because it can drive the previous reactions forward. And why is that not a problem in driving citrate synthase we talked about? Because citrate synthase is condensing acetyl-CoA with oxaloacetate, and acetyl-CoA has the high energy thioester bond. That's a little review of TCA, first TCA cycle step, which uses this as a substrate, right? Does that make sense? So that's, um, that's at least a plausible rationalization. I'm not saying it's the best one. And other, uh, other folks who, are, who might be talking about this could perhaps come up with other possible rationalizations, but this is at least um, something that makes sense for why we're passaging through the mitochondria here. Um, so there's other, there's other aspects of the, um, of the connection that we could take note of. Um, so we could note here in the urea cycle that the next step after we form arginine succinate by collecting the nitrogen from aspartate generating this big compound, is we basically split this part off as fumarate anyway. Right? And then fumarate can come in to malate, and malate can go back into the um, mitochondria. So to this extent, perhaps it, um, it uh, mitigates against the explanation I just gave. Um, so fumarate, malate. So here is, um, here's the urea cycle. And, okay, here's the cytosol. Here's the urea cycle. Where is fumarate? Here it is. So arginine succinate, arginine and fumarate. Fumarate to malate. Malate comes in. Malate makes oxaloacetate. Right? So maybe to that extent, you shouldn't believe what I just said. Because uh, oxaloacetate is then regenerated because the carbons come back in here. Right? Still, it's possible that there could be some effect on the concentration that would be depleting. Um, so this is called that, this is what that shunt was. So the other thing that this shunt does is um, when aspartate forms oxaloacetate in the cytosol, um, it has to get um, re sorry, reduced to malate to form NAD. And then the malate comes in and gets oxidizes those oxaloacetate. So this process actually moves an NADH from the cytosol into the mitochondria. So that's basically an ener the energy conservation step. Um, right. Otherwise, we can look at the process of the urea cycle as costing some energy. Um, because we had to use up energy to make this, two ATPs. And here, your textbook says, um, this is costing one ATP right, to go from here, ATP to PPI, right? and so um, uh, we generate AMP here um, <coughs> once it's uh, once this this part of the reaction goes, and this is the AMP in, in the intermediate. Um, but if you think about where AMP is on the energy scale, in order to remake ATP from it, you have to have two phosphoryl transfers. <coughs> So this is really not just one ATP, this is really two. And we'll see this example when we start talking about fats soon. Again, so if you, if you hydrolyze PPI off of ATP, 
this reaction can be driven by the fact that PPI can go to two phosphates. So you're getting sort of thermodynamic favorability out of that, right? And there, ha there has to be a cost for that if you look at it this way as well, right? Um, if you go from ATP to ADP, then you need to use up an ATP equivalent to get back. If you go to ATP to AMP, you need to use up two ATP equivalents to come back. Okay, does that make sense? Sometimes this is a confusing idea. But, you know, just ATP, ADP, AMP, if you're down here at AMP, you got two steps. So, you know, AMP goes to ADP by using a, using a phosphoryl transfer, and then ADP goes to ATP by using another one. So you basically have to, do, have to use two to make it back up. Yeah? So then in a question form, it would be, it uses two ATP, even though it uses ATP, then ADP. Yeah, it uses two ATP equivalents. I mean, it uses one ATP molecule in the reaction. But because you have to take, it takes you two to regenerate it, it, it effectively uses two equivalents of ATP. So you can't do, you can't do a two phosphate transfer in one step onto an ADP to make ATP. Onto an AMP. Or, yeah, onto an AMP to make ADP. Well, you, I, I mean, I can imagine an enzyme existing that sort of successfully polymerized phosphate, polymerized phosphates on there. Um, I mean, I could even imagine an enzyme that transfers pyrophosphate onto AMP, but there is no such enzyme. But that's not what we're talking about. Um, we're talking about how, what does it take to regenerate ATP from AMP? And it takes two phosphoryl transfer reactions in the cell. Yeah. There just isn't enough pyrophosphate. As soon as pyrophosphate gets made, it gets cleaved to two phosphates because inorganic pyrophosphatase is kind of always around. Right? So you could look at this as saying, well, PPI is showing up here, but this is gonna, that's going to help me drive this reaction because I, I immediately know that PPI can go to two phosphates. Right? Well, if I get that driving force, right, if I get that benefit, then I don't also get to imagine